How do you run an independent record label? How do you set yourself and your artist up for success long term? That's what we're going to be looking at in this episode of the New Music Industry Podcast. Let's welcome back to the show, head of NSDMT and founder of The Label Machine, Nick Sadler. How are you today, Nick? I'm I'm good. Um, thank you again for having me on the show, David, and really looking forward to it. Yeah, it's really great to have you back. And I think we've crossed the 250 episode mark already. You are the only return guest we've had so far. I think we're going to have more, but you have the honor of being the first. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah that's good news. So I mean, last time you were on the show, that was almost two years ago now, hard to believe. And the big news is that you got a new book, The Label Machine. So congratulations on your new book. It's jam-packed with value. How was the writing process for you and what did you learn from it? Yeah, thank you. It's, um, yeah, it's amazing to finally kind of see the book come out and, 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 and have it in hard copy as well. I was, I was very lucky, um, to get a actual book publishing deal as well, which, which I can talk about the story behind that as well, because there's, there's a bit of a there's there's a bit of malarkey involved in that happening Mm. but yeah to talk about the writing process what I did was I just got up every day first thing I'd do is I'd go downstairs and I'd make a plunger full of coffee and then I'd open up my laptop and then I would open up word and then I would just start typing and I would do that I'd type 500 words and then I'd just stop or if I was a little bit inspired I might keep going and that took about 30 minutes. And then I would just, I would stop, I would just close the laptop screen and then and then go on with my day. And I just did that like systematically and, and just very disciplined and doing it every day except Sunday mornings. And then about four months later, I had a book. The first draft, like the first draft was about 40,000 words and it was very much brain dumping. Um, I tried a few other different things as well. Like sometimes I'd kind of, realized I was on a bit of a flow and I, I would use on a Mac, you, if you double tap the function key, it'll automatically start transcribing for you. So I did that a little bit as well. Mm. But yeah, I, I kind of, that's how I got my first draft down. And then from that point, I then, then I, then I sort of started going, right, I got a book like, okay, actually do people edit it in Word or how do you go about it? I then found out there's an application called Scrivener, which is a, a, a application, which is a, uh, software that's specifically designed for writing books and it's a really good way of being able to like organize chapters and things like that and so it's quite quite a good organizational tool um, so I bought that and then I sort of put everything in Scrivener and started thinking about what's the flow of the book and editing it and, and going what else do I need to go into more detail about um, and then and then the next part as well was doing my research because I, I realized there were, you know, what, what are things going to be committed? You, you don't want them to get wrong. And I was, I was thinking, I, you know, like there'd be things I say sort of like, yeah, like I, I can't think of an example, but like something I always just thought was true, but I was like, where did I actually get that information from? Like, is, is that a, like, especially maybe talking about copyright or something like, is it actually true? Like, is the only way you can get your stuff copyrighted is doing this? Like, if you're com- committing it to book, you can't kind of go back on it. Mm-hmm. So there was about three pages of research that I had to go out and actually do my fact checking as well. Yeah, and then and then I sort of then I, I got to that point, and then you know I, I reread through the draft. My wife is very good at being uh, an editor for me. She's a really she's really like on her grammar and stuff and spelling. And then it ended up sort of throughout the process and getting to the end, it ended up being about eighty. I think 84,000 words. So I kind of nearly yeah. doubled it from first draft to the kind of final copy. Yeah. So that, that was kind of, that was my, that was my writing um, process and, and towards the end as well. So there's a bit of a break where I kind of set up the label machine, the, the platform part, which essentially is the second half of the book, which is the very, um, so I'll, I'll quickly kind of explain the book. It's in, it's in four parts. The first part is an overview of the music industry, like all the different parts and how they all kind of work together. And I've done like a little graph and with everything, mm-hmm. like all little arrows and stuff, which is um, kind of makes it easy to see. Then the second part of the book is copyright, uh, because I think that's a really misunderstood 
subject and I, I actually spent half my time working on that to get it to a point where if you if you don't understand copyrights and masters and publishing and how it works internationally because not just in the US because a lot of books out there will just talk about how it works in the US or we'll talk about how it works in the UK but most of us are now internationally releasing artists we need to understand how it works across the globe and so I kind of I I, when I wrote it, I had that in kind of in, in the in the forefront of my mind, and I've done, I think I've done a really good job. If if you don't, if you're completely new to the music industry, it'll break it down very simply, and you know I did some graphs and things like that. Um, so that's the next part, and of course, when you're running a label which is commercializing your music or self-releasing, you know you, you really need to understand copyrights because you know that's how you monetize your music, and that's how you eventually you get your your royalties through. And then the then the third and fourth part are the very practical elements of, of like you know how you go about setting up a label, how you go about releasing a record, how you go about marketing, and it goes into like huge amounts of detail. Like you know if you're reaching out to some a publisher, sorry, uh, if you're reaching out to a uh, Spotify curator here is the email text that you use. These are the bits you need to replace your name in your song. So I've, I've kind of gone very into detail. And, and that part of the book is what I, what I kind of turned into the, into the actual label machine platform. Um, so you could just, you know, rather than having to kind of copy stuff out of the book, you can just kind of um, click through. So I, I sort of, I took a break while I was converting on getting the platform up and running. And then when it came to actually, um, you know, when I, once I got the publishing deal and then the book came out, there's a real difference between, because I've, I've, I've sort of spoken to other authors, of having a book coming out in hard copy or a book coming out in ebook version. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, I guess the difference is like, you know, there's the, putting out a single on Spotify or putting out a single on vinyl. You know, the, the, when it goes physical, you know, you have to, like you have to get a typesetter um, on board. So they kind of like typeset everything. Um, like I said, you can't change anything. So you've really got to do all your kind of fact checking. And just that whole process was a lot, was a lot more, there's a lot more work involved than I initially thought. And, you know, just get even like images and then they've got to be a certain format and the color going back to the manufacturer, like are they going to fit this? And what, there's just so much, that there's so much more that went on to it. Um, than I did realize. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that was the advantage of going through a book publisher is they do this all the time. So that was like a really, you know, really um, helpful part for me as well. Um, yeah, so that that's uh, that was the writing process for me. Yeah, a few things by way of comment. I would have guessed it was around 80,000 to 100,000 words based on the length. So it sounds like I was right in there. Yeah, the process is something like I'm super familiar with that. It's kind of similar to what I've been doing lately, getting up, writing 300 to 800 words, and probably within three months or four months, I'll have my next book. Hardcovers are awesome. And I'm not going to say they're going to become more of a commodity, but Amazon KDP now has an option for hardcovers. It's a, still under beta, but I'm excited to work on new editions and hardcover editions of my book. And like you said, yeah, your book focuses on a lot of the practical aspects of how do I go about like really the ins and outs of the whole thing. And some of it, I just skim through because I'm like graphic design. I do that every single day, super familiar yeah. with that. <laughs> and then other stuff, you know, contracts and things like that. It's like, okay, right. It's nice to have a template for that because otherwise, what you're going to Google it and then try to adapt it and, and, and make it work mm. despite not being a lawyer or anything of the sort. So. Yeah. And, th and, th and I use that, you know, I put the template in there, but you know, an important thing is like, not, it's not like, here's a template, just use this. I have the template there and then I go through and explain what every single clause is, exactly. you know, in layman's terms. And, and then, so it also means when you do, because you will understand the contract and every single clause by the end of it, you actually know how you would change it for your individual situation, which I think is really important because, you know, you can just Google like, you know, recording agreement and you, you can download PDFs and, and they're out there. But like, you know, if you don't understand what it all means, it's, it's a, you know, it could be quite dangerous. You could be signing away something that you're not sure of. So um, yeah, that, that was kind of important for me as well to put that in the book. hundred percent. Yeah. I love that perspective. And in your book, you mentioned that 
if a manager is working with an independent artist, they usually take home 15%. I think what a lot of artists are going to ask or wonder about that is how much do they have to be making to have a manager in the first place? The reason why often many artists, managers are usually, can well, not usually, but can very often be a friend or a friend of the band is because when you're starting out, you need an extra set of hands. You need someone who's maybe fo- who is focused on more the business side of things, the marketing side of it. And in the early days, there isn't really much money, if any money to go around. So, you know, by having someone who just, you know, is into what you're doing and is, you know, just investing their time into it, you know, that's a massive advantage. And, you know, that's why there's a lot of managers in, in the industry that just, that's that's kind of how they came about and that's how they got into the industry. And, you know, they kind of learned as they went along. Because, I, I, you know, I, I don't know anyone, anyone that's gone to like, you know, a music, has got a music industry, a music manager degree because they want to become a music manager. It's sort of, it isn't kind of how it goes. Um, from a, so that's, that's one, that that's kind of one angle of looking at it. The other way is, yeah, how much money do you need to be making? So whenever I've picked up artists, it's usually been when they start playing live shows. So once an artist is at the point where they're going to be able to play live shows and it's either, you know, as a band playing or as a DJ playing and they're doing, at, you know, you want to be doing at least two shows a month and you want to be making, you know, five, $600 per show. Um, because then at that point, you're going to be, if you're, you know, let's say so that you're getting a grand a month, at that point, you're at least going to be getting around about um, $150. And and I, I say 15%, usually if it's a, a, the artist is starting off on that bottom end, it's actually 20% will be the manager's cut. Um, but, but once the artist starts making more money or if you sometimes bring on an artist who's already established, they got a little bit more power and, and there's more money to go around. So you can take 15% and still be getting a good cut. But yeah, it's a it's at that kind of point that 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 yeah, you you'll be able to get a manager who'll step in and, and kind of do the work because they'll be, and you'll be part of a that would be part of a roster deal as well. So you wouldn't be the the manager would probably have maybe six or seven other artists that would be looking after in, in that situation. So yeah, that that's kind of um and 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 that early on in, a, in an us career that's where money can come in quite quickly and compared to say music royalties if your music royalties are coming through um that is uh, that is another angle as well like you know if you're making enough money from your um, download sales or your streams um, and you need another pair of hands to kind of help out with your career again you know if you're bringing in more than about a grand a, a month you know then you're probably in a position to be able to start speaking to a manager you said makes a lot of sense i used to play in a band called angels breaking silence and we had a fifth member or manager he was really just our roommate carl and he looked after things like merch sales and helped us with recording demos and stuff like that our our drummer was actually the main engineer but he would teach carl how to you know he would teach him the ropes and show him how to do things so that kind of arrangement can definitely work well early on when you're trying to get established. And another point that you made in your book is like successful artists generally don't wait around for a manager or a label. So I like that point as well. Yeah. Yeah, of course. You just, you know, it's, it's not just managers, it's um, agents as well. Like, you know, a lot of artists, they, they sometimes think I need you know, to be successful, all I need to do is get a manager and an agent. And then, yeah, I, I like, like they'll take care of it for me. And man, like when you're ready to be managed, a manager will show up when you're ready to play live shows um, or, or if you're sort of organizing your own shows, but when there's enough demand where, you know, you're, you're as an artist, promoters want to be putting you on shows, then an agent will appear because what will happen is mm-hmm. like promoters, They've all got their connections to, to agents, right? And they'll be like, you know, we, we were like, uh, David's got this fucking hot track. And I was asking about, we want to put him on the show. Um, you know, do you know who his agent is? And they'll be like, he doesn't have one. And then that's at that point, the agent will go, awesome. Well, they'll reach out to you and say, hey, I'd love to represent you. Um, here's the deal. And of course, the reason why they want to represent you is because the promoters have been asking for you to play. And, you know, they just put one and one together. And um, yeah, I, it, it is definitely it's something 
you know, I see a lot of of, of artists, you know, they're I just are they're trying to get an agent, you know, like oh, I I want like almost like they're sending out their music CV to get one, and it's just it, it's not the way. Just focus on putting out your music and building an audience around you. That's important because people go on like, you know, and people the way that people are and scout now, you know, they go who's getting over you know, 50,000 plays on their Spotify, monthly Spotify plays. That's, they've clearly got an audience. We'll reach out to them. Um, you know, that that's that's the, that's the new metric for today. You know, how, are you, have you got an engaged audience on, let's say, uh, uh, Instagram's your platform of choice? Yeah, hey, wow, you know, these guys have got like 80,000 followers. But not only that, every time they post, you know, there's 3,000 like comments and likes and, and reactions these guys have got, you know, these guys have got an audience, like, and and you, believe me, people will start reaching out to you. Labels will start reaching out to you if you just focus on those, if you focus on putting out good music and building an audience, all those extra elements, people will come along and, and be willing to help you out. Something you said that if there was one thing to throw more money at, it would be album artwork. Why is that? If you're in a, if you're in a store going through vinyl, and you like you're looking for you know, and you're in a, to a particular genre, hard lounge music. I'm sure that doesn't exist, but let's <laughs> pretend it did. And you're going through that section, right? You're you're you know, if you don't recognize any of the music. You're going to be looking at, at the visual element and going, hey, wow, like, and because I know I've done it, and I'll be like, oh wow, this is like this artwork looks amazing. I'll go and listen to this song, like, because if 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 someone has if working with like artists that are quite talented and have got something very visual going on, most likely the sound is probably going to be matching up to that as well. I mean, that, that's one example. Um, I guess the second is, you know, your beyond your music, you know, the, the visual element is the other way that an audience can identify with you and and can see whether or not you're kind of part of their tribe and, and you know, and, and what they're kind of into. And, and your artwork will allow you to put that you know put what you what your visual vision is and, and your brand is that then you can connect with an audience and thirdly like your artwork it, like and especially on on online digital media when you're sharing stuff on instagram on tiktok on everything the artwork all, is almost the starting point like if you've got if you've got shit artwork then all your posts, you know, or you're like, hey, I'm sharing this, or you do like a little video edit of it or something, or you change your banners on like Facebook and Twitter and stuff, and the artwork looks terrible. Well, it's just going to make everything look terrible. Whereas if you've got sick artwork that looks amazing, suddenly everything looks amazing. You know, all your banners look amazing. When you're posting stuff looks amazing. So like that's that's a kind of like... Yeah, the, the the third reason is is another kind of key part to why it's really important to get your artwork um, looking as amazing as possible. Yeah, and there was a day not too long ago when we used to walk into record stores and then just choose albums based on the artwork without knowing a thing about the music, right? And those days might be over, but as you say, in your branding and your marketing, you can utilize mm. something that looks great. And, and start from there. That's a great starting point for any kind of yeah. marketing initiative. Yeah. I mean, especially from an out, like, uh, like singles. Yeah. Albums, a hundred percent. Like, mm. you know, it becomes the theme. If you do have singles off the upbeats recently, their latest album, the artists they work with, the, the album artwork is amazing. And then they had the artist design three singles that were variations of that album artwork. So the whole theme of everything that went through with their promotion just looked amazing. And, and, you know, the other, the other um, thing about that is if you're going to be, you know, you drop an album nowadays, you want to have some sort of physical element to it. Hey, we're going to be doing t-shirts, tote bags, um, like stickers, badges, the artwork. If you've got amazing artwork, all that stuff's done for you, you know. If it looks amazing on like a T-shirt, people will just buy it because it looks cool as a T-shirt, regardless of the fact that it's like an album artwork. Yeah, I, I just, I, yeah, I, I can't, I can't stress it enough, you know. And, and also, when people do do terrible artwork, or they, they're not designers and they sort of try and do it themselves, and they've got, you know, three different font styles <laughs> on the front, you know, you just go like. Am I gonna? Is this the music behind this gonna be any good? Probably not. Skip, and you know you've lost someone then. 
I learned what I think I'm, I think might be a, an important lesson recently. I released a meditation track. It's 15 minutes and the album artwork is basically the night sky, the Northern lights with a hill and the Northern lights reflected in the water. I enhanced it a little bit in Photoshop, increased the saturation, looks great. I put it out there and then I realized that people like on Instagram and people were commenting on the artwork, the photo. And I was like, oh, right. There should be something representing or telling the, the user what it is. There's, there's, no, there's no text on there. There's nothing saying oh. that this is a meditation. So that was a fun little experiment. <laughs> It's kind of like a spinal well, tap. So what are you it's playing? all black. It's all black. So what are you? Um. So what are you? How are you changing that round? Are you? Yeah. How have you kind of addressed that? You know, with that track, I haven't. I kind of moved on and, and did my next release because you know, uh, I just became an award-winning composer. Actually, ended up winning three awards for a short film. So I'm really excited for that. But like, yeah, I think the the trick would probably be just to include guided meditation for transformation title plus artist name that might be a good yeah. starting point okay look well, i think we have to go we have to go slightly sideways sorry mm -hmm. listeners we're going to slightly reverse this mm. um you just said you got uh uh you composed for a short film did the short film win awards the short film win award or was it particularly for your music that it won the award so it has been a finalist in, in some of the awards, awards and film festivals, but I won Best Original Score three oh, times. Which film festival? It, uh, so I won Hollywood on the Tibber Film Awards, Vesuvius yeah. International Film Festival, and New Jersey Film Awards so far. There might be more coming. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, as well as running the label machine, I also have First Flights, which is um you know my film production company and we we help out first-time filmmakers make their features and i and part of that is i run a, a short film fund um twice a year as well so i'm very much in the short film world and in fact where i'm called where we're doing this call from i'm at the aesthetica short film festival up in york in the uk right now mm. um i mean i'm in i'm in the hotel and 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 tomorrow i'm speaking on some panels and whatnot about it so yeah it's a very big part of my um of my world these days as well so um interesting to see that we're crossing over from music into the film and entertainment like kind of greater universe um uh, both at the same time it's amazing it is. It seems to be where some of the opportunities are beginning to open up in my life besides this composition gig, which I think there, there's going to be more of those. I've also been invited to work on sort of a musical or, or shows a goal, we'll call it, and a local web series as well. So I don't know how all these opportunities are coming together at this moment. I'm just it's kind of staying open, right? It's like I've I've done certain things for so long. Some of my contracts are coming to an end. It's a good time to reflect and review and go, what what do I really want to engage in next? And so I'm just staying really open to to what's possible. Mm. Oh, amazing. That's great yeah. news. So you mentioned growing multiple email lists to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And I think a couple of strategies you, you talked about was using contests and what you call the fan funnel. What can you tell us about those? And I think some people are actually struggling to get past a hundred, right? Some people are listening, going, I don't have that problem, but certainly there's going to be artists and, and business owners listening, going, I can't even get past a thousand. Yeah. So, you know, how do you grow your email list as, as, as the, is the question and you know yes. um whether or not you're a musician or a business yeah how do you grow how do you grow your email list and god it's such a big subject okay where do i start <laughs> so <laughs> um i mean there, there's there's you know one of the artists in the label machine at the moment we're, we're kind of looking at how we're going to be growing how we're going to be growing her email list at the moment um the first thing i want to do is get your email provider set up so set up a mailchimp send in blue drip you know so these are the platforms yes. that are specifically designed for managing email lists and creating emails that you send out to large amounts of people um which you can't do using your gmail or your outlook because they have a cap of you know you can't send out more than 150 emails a day or, or an hour or something that have limits on it um so you do need to use one of these providers so the first thing you want to do is, is sign up to one of those now, now, something you can do to, to, you know, the reason why you want to have these emails is so you can build a relationship with people. And, uh, and all of them now have something called a drip 
functionality. And what a drip means is you write, you pre-write out a sequence of emails. And then when someone signs up to your email list, it says, you know, when they first get the, you know, day one, you send out the welcome email. Um, three days later, send out a second email and you might say, hey, um, are you on Instagram? Just check out my Instagram account, click here and follow me and comment on like why you, um, you know, whatever your, you know, tag what your favorite artist is or something. And then a week later, send out another one. So that that's the kind of background that you want to get set up. Um, so when someone does actually, when you do get an email address, um, you can start engaging with people um, automatically. Um, and then on top of that as well, you'll be sending your sort of, um, if you've got a um, single coming up, you'll be emailing people about like this single email release date when the pre-order goes live. Uh, and then the day that it's actually go live. So you can have three key emails with that. And then there's the the um, seasonal email. So you're going to send something around Christmas, um, you know, maybe something Black Friday specials and things like that. So that, that's the kind of setting up the system in the background. Uh, then how do you get people to plug into it? So about 10 years ago, the really obvious thing was, into, you know, put your email address in to download the song. And when we were in a download market, um, that made a lot more sense because people were downloading stuff onto their iPods. In the streaming era, it's slightly more challenging. Now, if you are doing any kind of electronic music or hip hop music, it is still a it is it is still a very valid way of growing your email list because DJs still need to download tracks to play in their sets when they get when they you know any kind of club music right DJs got to play the music any kind of music that DJs play and mix they still need to download it like because there isn't a streaming solution yet um they're working on it but you know it's still many years or it's still many years away so if if you're listening and you're in those genres you, your job is slightly easier because you can just simply you know download you know uh, two weeks ahead of a release date you, know, you can send something out hey download my latest single here um and uh, in exchange for an email address and and there are a couple of different platforms that allow you to do that easily. Hyped it is one, toned in is one. So these are these are websites that will create a page for you where someone can enter the email address and download it. Kind of kind of takes care of it, all of that for you. Um, I, I don't know if the the I don't, some of the like Mailchimp and um, Send and Blue you can kind of hack a way of doing that, but it's but it's a bit clunky it's better off you kind of use one of these services for doing that now. So that's great. So then that's what I would say. And, and, and historically as well, like when in the, in the past, when I've set up labels, the way we've grown, so you've, you know, with these two things we're looking at, we've, you've got an artist break growing the um, email list for an artist account as a record label, you know, you've, because you're releasing a lot more tracks, it's a little bit easier to build your list up because you've got, a, you know, you've got a more regular flow of music and, you know, back in the day, we would often release an EP we would pick one of the tracks off the EP and say, um, enter your email address to download it. Um, and oddly, the track that we'd gave away for free would be the best seller, which would never seem to make sense because yeah. you could literally Google the track name and type free download and the top hit would be the link to where you can just enter your email address and download it. So it was for free, but then it still sold the most. I, I, I my theory on that was that because it was being shared so wi widely, people were like playing it and people were like shazamming it. And then, you know, just the word of mouth, you know, so while someone, you know, if someone cares and likes the track, then they go and, you know, seek it out to buy it. They don't instantly think, oh, well, it must be available for free, even though maybe the way they heard it was from someone who got it for free. That was kind of my theory um, on, on kind of how that worked. So yeah, so that so that's that's a that's one key way of doing it. Now, if you're if you're not doing that kind of music, what are some things that you can do? So, um, if you're a singer songwriter, um, you can do a record an acoustic version, um, and if you can record an acoustic version video, you can then upload a you can upload that video with the track onto an unlisted YouTube an unlisted YouTube video. And then to access that link, which is unlisted, so you know you can't search for it, you don't have to enter your email address, and then people, you know, you send them to the mm. link to kind of have it. So that's that's kind of one way around it. <sighs> what are some other ways? Um, competitions uh, are really good. Um, enter your email address, you know, create a bundle, and you know the bundle can be 
Um, you know, you could even just go and I've seen people, you know, give away all sorts of things like, you know, unrelated, like a PlayStation or, you know, like some uh, merch, you know, go out and buy just some new stuff, you know, two or $300 worth of something that's maybe related to whatever they're doing. Maybe you're really into snowboarding, snowboarding gear, whatever it is, you run a competition into your email address to win this. So um, the closer you can get it relating to your music, because you want to get fans who are into you as well, otherwise it's just, you know, you don't want to be doing a competition that they're never ever going to be able to follow up on. So that's a good way of doing it. And probably, and to be honest, another key way, like, the labels I've worked in have, has has grown their email list is by having a storefront and every release selling like creating a merch pack for the release. So a really cut down merch pack that we would do would be a t-shirt, a CD, and people still buy CDs, um, yep. stickers, and a badge. So those four things, like twenty five dollars, right? Every time someone buys that one of those things, you get an email address and, you know, they're, they're handing over cash so you know they're going to keep buying it. Then we do like just T-shirt and download only um, and then we do badge and stickers only and then download only. Um, that was a key way of building up that email list. Um, and, to, and today as well, like with... Um, so back back in the day, what we do is we do pre-orders on the T-shirts um, and then, you know, when we get to, you know, 50... Once we kind of hit 50 of those orders we would then go out and actually get those t-shirts manufactured and based on the, like how many people ordered small, medium, large, you know, we'd kind of like double up type thing and then bring that in. Um, and, you know, we'd do like say a hundred of the CDs, you badges and stickers, you know, you, you, you're ordering like 500 of those at a time because they're quite cheap um, and then put those together. These days though, um, you know, get your badges and stickers done, less than a hundred dollars, you can get a whole bunch of those. Um, print on demand. So you can have somebody you don't actually have to manufacture the t-shirts as well but that's that's a that's a really key part and I, it's a little bit of work but it's totally and utterly worth it um and that's a really key way of yeah getting email addresses because when you buy something obviously you know you have to hand over your email address for the invoicing and stuff what else um other key ways of getting email addresses i mean there's the obvious if you're playing out live you know having your manager walk around with an ipad with one of the, um, you know, sign up to our mailing list to, you know, get a free EP. Um, something we're doing for one of the artists, um, Siren, she's had four, she's had four tracks out, four singles out since she's kind of launched herself in the last year and a half. So for coming up for Christmas, we're going to do a compilation um, of those four tracks um, that you can get for free. Um, by entering your email address so it's like a fan only compilation so it's not a compilation that's going to be available on spotify or or you know apple music or anything um but it will be available and we're going to use that as like i think she's going to do like a little like mini mix of the four tunes as well so that's like something special um and then that's going to be you know a download into your email address and download it it's ele it's electronic music as well we're, we're also talking about possibly doing a stem version so you can remix one of the or, or a couple of the tracks as well and so that's kind of targeting the kind of dj producers out there as well yeah so that's like an example of of uh, creating another asset yeah and and beyond that yeah no, nothing off the top of my head but it's yeah it's creating that kind of something that's a bit unique that you can get an uh, email um for now and you're I that enough? <laughs> oh, you've unloaded lots there thank you <laughs> in your book you talk about setting up a business plan you also show in a chart what your projected revenue might look like over the course of a year running a label my question though is have you ever had to diagnose and repair a business that wasn't working no not really mm. come to think of it um so yeah I can't, really go, I can't go anywhere with that question i've i've always been part of like startups rather than coming into like, hey, this isn't working, can you turn it around for us? Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I think as well, the label machine at the moment is is focused on predominantly people that are starting. But yeah, over the, you know, over the next couple of years, I'm definitely starting to look at expanding that audience into labels that are already running and they want to run but you know they want to grow and they want to kind of run better as well and, and I'm, I'm creating some you know like some different courses around that and, and what that kind of looks like so yeah I, you probably have to ask me that question in a couple of years and i'll have a better answer well i guess it's just an indicator that you're you've been a success machine so far which yeah. is a good thing. well yeah 
some things work out, some things don't, but yeah, focus on the good and, and then, you know, move on from the bad. Something or in an area where I haven't been the strongest is definitely in the area of, of business plans. So I'm discovering for myself, reading in your book going, huh, that could be something, right? I'm always on an adventure. I'm always discovering new things and I'm sharing those new discoveries on this podcast. Is there a magic to the business plan or is it like you just got to have it in case anybody comes to invest or in case you want to get funding or? Yeah, that's a really good question. So like doing a business plan can be pretty boring and I know loads of people, yeah. you know, start their music careers and they don't really have they don't have a business plan. They're just kind of winging it. And it works, you know, if you've got loads of contacts or at least maybe you're an artist that's already, you know, successful and, and, you know, you can basically just, you know, put out an Instagram post, Hey, I'm starting a label, sign up here and, you know, get a thousand people signing up because, you know, you're, you're young blood or someone, you're someone who already is kind of famous. I mean, that that's, that's the, that, that's not the norm. The reason why I really, really push people to do a business plan apart from the obvious having a plan and figuring where you want to go um it, you know is 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 always um the best mode of mood moving forward it allows you to be organized but i think the biggest impact it has is it forces you to make decisions so you know so you do know which way you're going like it forces you to go what are so if we're taking it from someone who's just starting afresh or, or even let's say yeah you have been running for a while and it's like what am i doing for 2022 like what like who am i signing what are the first three tracks you know who who, who are these and, and writing them down like who is going to be doing that artwork where is the money going to be coming from? Like, what is the, what is the, what is the brand? Like, what are, you know, who, are we, are we going to be all bright colors? Is it going to be all kind of dark? You know, I think, so you're starting asking, you're starting to kind of answer those questions about marketing. And, you know, I think sometimes businesses can stall or not move quickly because people haven't sat down and made a decision on something. They're like, um, uh, maybe it'll be like this and it's almost like they're waiting for somebody to come along and tell them how it's going to be and that's never really going to happen because if it's your own you know your own label or your own um, brand you're the one who's in control of it if you don't make you know these decisions so then people around you know which direction you're going and know whether they they know whether a they can plug into it or not and if they are plugging into it are you on the same page and so I think that's a really important part about you know, going through the writing a business plan, going through the process. And, you know, there's some things you might not know and, and you can put like still to decide. And, you know, when it could probably, when it comes to budgeting as well, like, you know, you are sort of to some degree sort of pulling numbers out, out of the air because, you know, you don't know how well it's going to go. Um, but it's still important to go, okay, but I know how much, I, if I'm going to do a release, you know, how much am I going to be spending $200 on Facebook advertising? Am I going to do Facebook advertising or not? You know, how much is artwork? And, you know, just how many, even just how many releases I'm going to do in a year? I'm going to do five releases. Okay, so five releases means over a 12-month period, I'm going to be putting out a release approximately every eight to nine weeks. Okay, well, I've, you know, and if I do a six-week lead-in, okay, I've, I'm going to have to be pretty busy on this. And then, like, you know, let's say the artwork's $200. Okay, cool. I need at least $1,000 for artwork for the next year. Just all those kind of things gives you a far more realistic, you know, am I going to be able to do it? Actually, you know what? I, I That's actually nuts. There's no way I'm going to be able to do five. So I can't sign five artists. I actually just need to sign three artists. And, you know, my budget is here. Or I, actually, wow, I've got a bigger budget. I'm, I'm going to, you know, invest in this. And, and if you have got a bigger budget, you could probably be more attractive to potential people that you're signing because you're going to be investing in them. So, yeah, that, those, those are my reasons for why doing a business plan is, is really important. You talk about Instagram and Facebook ads being the gold rush right now. How important is paid versus organic? Is organic still possible? It sounds like you're using a mixed approach regardless, but I would love your perspective on that. Yeah. So the reason why I say it's a bit of a gold rush is, you know, for anyone that's listening, maybe you've heard about the new iOS 14.5 changes at Facebook. Uh, sorry, that Apple have bought in because they're putting the privacy rights of their users first, which is great. Um, but what it means is it's becoming harder to have to to target your audience very specifically and to find out whether or not they doing valuable conversions 
on your um, on your destinations. Um, and it's the first sign where it's going to get harder and harder to reach an audience because in 10 and like, yes, you know, it is ridiculous that you can go, what kind of music do you sound like? I sound like, you know, I sound like Bonobo and Fortet. Um, can you put my music in front of people? Because my music is the same in front of these people to check out. Yes. Yes, you can. And this is, and you, and you know, you pay like cents, like less than a dollar to get in front of those people and, and, and have them click and convert and listen to your music. Like that is insane. Like never in history have you been able to do it. And in 10 years, it will be, it will be a lot harder. It might be possible, but it'll be way more expensive. And again, it will just probably go back to the people that are like major record labels with huge budgets. We'll be able to reach that audience and it'll be a lot tougher for the independent musician. And people in 10 years are going to go, you had it so good. You know, you could mm -hmm. just spend two or $300 and reach thousands of people, thousands and thousands of fans. Like, why were you not just working like three jobs and putting all your money into growing your audience? I, like, I, I don't, I think people really don't realize how powerful and, and how and how we are in just this kind of golden age you know like i i cannot stress it enough it, it's it's a really it, it's a it's a great time um and you know and, and it's and it's worth investing your time and figuring out how to do it um yeah i i, I was it was was there something else i i kind of wanted to stress that but there's something else about your question as well what was it yeah i was mentioning about right? organic reach as well and how that compares and if it's like a blended approach that works best. Yeah, I mean, you 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 do your paid to grow, you're organic to engage with who you've grown it to, right? right? So, I mean, you know, if, if you've got a uh, hundred followers on Instagram and you put a post out, you know, you might get, let's say 5% of people commenting it. So you get five likes, right? You've got a hundred followers. You spend, you do an advertising campaign to grow that to a thousand followers. Then when you do another post, your organic reach is about 5%, say. So therefore you have 50 people that are commenting on it. You know, that's the, the organic just kind of comes off the back of that growth that you've done from your um, paid advertising. That, that's, that's how I kind of see them working together. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of little tip, tips and there's lots of kind of tricks and stuff you can do like Instagram, like, so you can't, and Facebook, you can do a campaign in which you can say, I want to grow my followers and 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 you just create that campaign and you can get a, a bunch of followers, which is becoming, um, I guess, less and less as a key metric in the industry because people know how easy it is to do. You can, you know, even doing it officially, you can just pump loads of money in and get hundreds of thousands of followers on Facebook. It doesn't, you know, like, and, and they're probably engaged. Instagram is tougher and most artists I'm talking to these days, Instagram is where it's at for them. That's where that's the platform they're using to engage with their fan base. Now with Instagram and the Facebook, um, Facebook, Instagram uh, ads manager, you can't go, I want to run a campaign in which I want to grow my Instagram followers. It, it just, they don't have that in there. Um, so you do have to create engaging comments to, to get people to kind of follow you. But what you can do um, which we've done, you know, we took uh, one of our artists who had about 1,500 followers up to about 14,000 followers um, using this particular campaign. Um, we just had her say, um, hey, uh, I'm Gemma, you know, this is my artist name, um, and uh, I've got new music coming out soon. Um, if you want to, uh, like, click, um, click my bio link and follow, and, you know, she kind of pointed at the bio link, um, um, to yeah, to hear my new tracks and my stuff coming out. Like it's kind of a very simple kind of thing, just introduction and follow me to kind of like you know hear more of my music. And then that was a story, and then we promoted that story to thousands and thousands of people. So she had a clear call to action, and that's how we grew um, the following for her, and, and it worked really well. So you know there are ways you can kind of you know you can design campaigns to grow your Instagram followers, um, you know, which is, and I think Instagram and TikTok are the two places where artists and, you know, what are we now, November, 2021, if when you're listening to this, yep. if you're listening to this into the future today, <laughs> <laughs> November, 2021, uh, Instagram and TikTok is where you want to be. Um, and, and yeah, and probably 
you know, TikTok over Instagram at the moment, just because it's slightly newer and it's it's easier to get higher engagement on. Oftentimes, simple works best with advertising. That's what we found as well. Doing a campaign for an artist a couple of years back, we tried sharing her live performance and her new music and what ended up really working those campaigns were okay what ended up really working was just a simple picture of her saying hi this is who i am please like my page if you like to continue to follow with my latest releases mm -hmm. and then that was a like campaign we could have run until eternity to keep getting more likes on her page it, it was that great so yeah yeah i mean i i you know if you're a, if you're a female as well um and you are open to making yourself not look as pretty as possible but like kind of i guess putting your best foot forward right and that helps out a lot i i have to say you know if you're uh for males it's a little tougher you've kind of got to go on the you know you've really got to get a stylist involved in making sure you look like very very cool to kind of get that same reaction it's true but uh but yeah, if I guess if you've got it, use it. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's why it helps to look completely bizarre, like David Bowie or Kiss or something like that, right? Then you actually yeah. stand out. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's been a great conversation. Really appreciate your time and generosity. Thanks for coming back on the show. Any thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with? Two things. A, if you're interested in starting a record label, obviously come to the labelmachine.com right. um, and, you know, uh, and also search on Amazon and, and, and buy the book and join up to the platform. Um, but not only that, if you're just, if you're listening to this and you're a music artist, one of the best ways you can grow your career is by thinking like a record label, because a record label is all the components, all the important components to make an artist a success. It takes the creative part, your actual music, and commercializes it. And it, it has your marketing arm, it has the distribution arm, it has the branding arm. You know, like often artists are like, kind of, you know, oh, I, I just need to do this one thing, I'm gonna do this like Instagram course, and I get loads of fans and stuff, you know, and it's and they're kind of chasing all these things. And it's like, you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, it's already there. Like the, mm -hmm. the record label model is it. And either, you know, so you you don't you know you don't have to necessarily start a full blown record label in the traditional sense of signing artists, but you need to think of yourself if you're like self releasing your music as a record label or as a music label because if you do that you're going to cover all the important aspects um, and you know it, and and you have the absolute foundations to become a success in the music industry. You know, it's, and it's why ultimately people like, I want to get signed to a record label because they're going to take care of all that kind of stuff for you. But, you know, getting signed to a record label these days is hard. They, like many majors and even like big independents, they're now looking at artists who have already, you know, who already get it, who have already got an audience, who are already releasing music, who've got momentum behind them, right? So how do you create that momentum? Just think like a record label, apply all the same principles. So you know, if you're listening and you're like, well, I don't, you know, the label machine start a record label, like I don't need to start a record label. Like, it's not about that. Like, it, it's about like using the record label mentality to grow your career. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and, a, and that's like 90% of what we kind of, you know, uh, teach and support at the label machine. So yeah, if there's, if there's, it, that's kind of the one thing I'd always want to kind of share with people. Um, and, and also, you know, like going through the process, learning about copyright, it's all like, information is power. Like when you do, let's say, get a record label deal, you're going to, you're going to have a far better understanding of what's going on. You know, you're not going to get ripped off. You're going to be in a far better position to negotiate a great deal for yourself because you get it. You know, when they're talking about distribution, you're going to get what they understand. You've looked at a record contract, you know, all the different components. They're not going to be able to pull the wool over your eyes. Getting Nick's book is the shortcut. So make sure to pick up your copy for all the mindset and marketing and practical principles you need to, to set yourself up for success. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, no problem, David. Uh, thanks for having me on again. So if you enjoyed this episode of the New Music Industry Podcast and want to figure out how you can take care of your artists or even give your own music a serious boost, I want to invite you to download our new free training called Music Money Machine. If you're discouraged and tired of trying to stand out from the crowd only to come up empty handed, this training is for you. Claim it now at musicentrepreneurhq.com slash machine. 
This has been episode 254 of the New Music Industry Podcast. I'm David Andrew Weave, and I look forward to seeing you on the stages of the world. Thank you for listening. Music in this episode was brought to you by Brian Young. Wherever you're listening to this right now, please consider leaving a five-star review and comment to help us get the word out about the podcast. Hey, thanks for watching, Music Entrepreneur. Just so you know, between now and November 19th, 2021, if you purchase any of our e-bundles, courses, or coaching programs on content marketing musician created specifically to help you get results in your music career, we're giving 50% of the proceeds to the education of underprivileged children in South America. This is to honor my late father and grandparents who also contributed greatly to the cause. Head on over to contentmarketingmusician.com com slash products to check out our selection and if you don't see what you need or have a request for some other training feel free to let me know also don't forget to like comment and subscribe if you enjoyed this video